Hello, welcome to part two of my Heister winch rebuild. If you missed part one, I'll put a link up somewhere around here. And I basically tore it down in the last video and this one I'm starting to clean it up and put it back together. There's a lot of work to do, so let's get right to it. I've scraped off the heavy dirt already and uh, I think it's pretty much ready to go. I'm gonna spray some degreaser on it, let it sit for a while. Now all the gears and shafts and bearings, I am gonna wait and clean as I put them on. And that is to keep everything organized. It's all kind of in a group. It's, there's a system here, trust me. And if I start taking it all apart and clean it, it's gonna be a disaster. Yeah, this is the worst spray bottle ever. While I was pressure washing, I forgot I had to take this shaft off. I think the shaft's supposed to come out, go out that way. Um, there's a lock nut on here and that snapped right off. So I have an extractor in it now. I'm gonna heat this up and hopefully can get it out. Nope. That was no good to film because it was in that case. But basically what happened is I knocked this collar all the way down. And then I think the end of this was mushroom, most likely for me hitting on it. So what I should have done is I should have hammered it back out and then ground off the mushrooming that was happening here. But what I did instead is I was heating this thing up red hot and then tapping it down and it, it got over the mushrooming and there's not, you can see there's, there's a little bit of damage there. That's probably for me hitting on it. And then I was able to just tap this off. So that was, that wasted basically an hour of my time. Okay, ready to kind of clean out the inside here. This is what I'm gonna use. I'm gonna use a scaler, wire brushes, and then the die grinder with a wire wheel on it. Just a quick note on these. So this is a wire wheel that's meant for a die grinder. It actually has max 20,000 uh, RPM stamped on it. It's, it's DeWalt brand. I think I got it off Amazon. If you get those ones at like Harbor Freight or Home Depot that are meant for drills, which spin at like 2000 RPM, um, those will immediately just break apart when you, when you use it on something like this. So make sure you don't use the cheap ones if you're doing this. So I'm just wiping down the inside. I'm using coffee filters and <clears throat> denatured alcohol just to really clean off the surface before I coat it. And the reason I'm gonna coat it is because this is a really rough casting and just rust is gonna build up in here and, and, uh, and cause the same problem. It's a lot of work cleaning out this side because this was the brake band side, which was the dirtiest. The rest of the casting interior should be a lot easier. So this is Gliptol, if you've never heard of it. It's been around since like the 60s, I think. Um, it's a really good primer, it goes direct to metal. So this casting's really uh, rough and porous and it'll basically seal that up. It has a lot of interesting properties. It's uh, water and oil phobic, so it actually aids in lubrication because the, the oil will not stick inside of all these little grooves in the case. I'm using it because I had to have a quart of it here and I know it's going to work good. 
A lot of people are gonna tell you you have to bake this once it's on, but you do not. All, of the, all the baking does is it just gives it a smoother finish. It's a nice change of pace from the yellow. I guess if you're a yellow paint enjoyer, you might not like this, but this stuff does eat through. If you use the wrong kind of paintbrush, it'll eat through it, but that cheap brush I was using actually didn't fall apart, so happy about that. Good news, by the way. Starting tomorrow, the weather's actually supposed to warm up, and it's going to be a normal spring, maybe. So by the time this is all buttoned up and, and done, I think it'll be good to paint the actual engine and tractor, which is basically being almost done with this project. This stuff dries really fast, by the way. It's, it's literally 10 minutes and it's, you can already touch it. So now that that's done, I need to pay some attention to this flange. So this is a non-oil holding area. Um, that's why it was full of water. That's why it's all rusted out right here. You can, it almost looks like it's cracked right there, but it's not. And uh, so all the way around. So I'm gonna use the steel stick again on this, like I did with the brake covers, and then I'll sand it all flush. There's also this flange right here, which doesn't look too bad on this side. They were really aggressive with the RTV. This is the plate that goes over it. This is, I'm pretty sure this is not original. This looks like it was cut out with a plasma cutter. Um, and it's, it's quite a bit thicker, but I'll reuse it. I'll just, I'll just flatten that out and then fix this flange. I've also cleaned up these. These are the linkage that I had to remove earlier. You can see how much I banged that up, but it's, it should still be fine. That was just my own laziness. I should have done it the right way, but it'll be okay. I need to uh, tap that out for the right size screw. And I think the hole, I didn't damage it when I drilled that out. So the shaft is a little bit worn, but it only rotates this much when you use the brakes. This video is gonna end up being sponsored by Steel Stick, I think. I'm gonna go through a lot. I think the most critical part's up on the top because that's where the water's gonna get in. But I'll make sure I clean this up as well. This is what I meant in the last video about prep work really being boring and not fun to video. I mean, I'm doing hours and hours of work here and out of all that, there's like just a few minutes of worthwhile footage. What is going on over here? Is there an animal in there, dog? Where did this even come from? I've never seen this pipe before. Oh, there's something in here. I don't think we want to see an animal murdered on camera. Let's go this way. Oh. <laughs> oh, I bet you it's a ground squirrel. I might need to murder this off camera. You should see my lawn. <laughs> yep, dog doesn't even see it. Try. You lost it already. You're the worst hunter ever. She dragged that pipe all the way from under that red barn, I think. That's the only other place I have ABS pipe. And she lost it after all that. It might not look it on camera, but this is like very, very smooth to the touch around this gasket surface. So this is a removable cover, so I'll be putting a cork, a big fat cork gasket on it too. And then I'll do Permatex 3 on one side and then grease on this side so I can take it off and adjust the brake when I need to. The nice thing about the palm sander is it uh, doesn't have enough juice to go through the steel. So as soon as it starts bottoming out, it flattens out everything perfectly. And this is like mirror smooth to my fingertips here. So those two things are for the shaft, but I'm gonna paint all this brake stuff, whatever I can. No, I'm not gonna paint the outside of the drum. Everything else I'll paint. Normally I'd paint this cat yellow, like the rest of the machine, but with that brick red interior, I think I, I would lose subscribers over how bad that would clash. So 
And I'm just gonna go a nice gray on everything. This was well timed, but a subscriber sent me this primer to try. I've, I've never even heard of this brand before, but this is Ken Montana. He swears by it. it. Says four cans in one, so we'll see how accurate that is. He even sent me a keychain. I like that logo. Skookum Timber in Montana. Anyways, thanks Ken, we'll give it a shot. Got all this stuff ready for paint. It's very, very pitted, but uh, it'll be fine. I got new pins and bushings for everything. The uh, star of the show is this knotted brush on the die grinder. This is a very cheap die grinder, but this knotted brush, I've been using the, the heck out of it, and it's a couple spots are, are a little bit broken, but this thing is awesome. Before I had just a normal brush, like a wire brush, and it kind of fell apart pretty quick, but this thing is really holding up to it. All right, Ken, here we go. This stuff puts out a lot of material really quickly. This is great, actually. Look at that. It's like a fire hose. This stuff comes out so fast. This is amazing. On the big casting here, I already painted that side. This is like the side you're never gonna see because it's made it up against the other one. In here, you can kind of, I've, it's really clear, it's ready for painting here right now, I'm about to. But uh, you can see this crack. There was a lot of slag and other junk in here and it was just falling out. So I spent a lot of time chiseling on it with the, uh, the scaler and then just wiping it down and making sure nothing else came out of here. And then hopefully I'm gonna put on a bunch of different coats of uh, Gliptol to hopefully seal that up. You can also see maybe there's a repair there and potential other repairs there. That could just be a, a cut down for the first assembly. Another weld there. This side's also ready for paint. Looking pretty clean. So not really much to film here, just more brushing it on. Coat number one is done. I'm not gonna do a coat two, but I am gonna come through here and touch up any areas that I missed. And I'm also, I am gonna coat this again. This stuff dries in about 10 minutes, so you can easily do multiple coats very quickly. But you can see here, there's just some areas where I missed. It was getting a little dark when I was doing it. All right, well, pretty happy with how it turned out. It's not perfect, but it's uh, much better than it was. You might think this is overkill, but I mean, I really, really want a good working winch. That's the only reason I really bought this tractor in the first place. So if this thing outlasts me, which I think it will, I'll be happy. Well, as promised, it took about two or three weeks to get cleaned up and painted and prepped for everything. But uh, you can see ready to install it. The only things I did off camera that I don't really show, I filled in some pitting here and uh, down here with uh, some steel stick just because there was a couple of concerning areas. And then I sanded this whole flange. So I, cha I also chased all the threads throughout this whole thing. Cleaned up those. I'm, I'm going to lock tie them and I'm still going to safety wire them just for looks. As I said at the beginning, none of this is cleaned up yet, so I'm going to clean it as I put it on, starting with that shaft and then that shaft, and then I forget which goes next. First step, I think this is the last thing I took out was this shaft. This bearing looks fine. There's not any play. So I'm just going to hose it off and then just stick it back in. So I'm just soaking this stuff in like royal purple or simple green or whatever, a color, a degreaser with a color in it. And then uh, I'm blowing it out with compressed air and then just soaking it in some gear oil before I put it in. It's not much to it. Yeah, the smell of fresh gear oil, something this machine probably hasn't smelled in quite a while. Ooh, this thing spins nice. It's a good sign. Next shaft is the input shaft. I'm gonna have to take this apart because there's a seal in here I wanna replace, obviously. And it's also pretty, pretty gross. I 
Nothing on here is very tight. It's very convenient. Oh, <laughs> there's another snap ring right there. That's how they get you. I'm probably gonna have to hit it from the bottom now to loosen that up. Let's see if I can break it free here. Yeah, see it spins. It's just the spacing between here is way too small. I've never seen a snap ring like this before. It's like the spacing here is like two millimeters, if that. And I can hold it with my finger and kind of wedge it, but even if it's completely, the ends are touching, there's not enough slack for it to pop out. My goodness. So I don't, in case you couldn't tell, these pins were so close together I couldn't compress it enough to get it out. Uh, so either this is some horrible, cruel joke from Heister, or it's been apart before and they didn't, they used a different ring, it's the wrong one. So I'm just gonna cut this one back and angle them out like normal snap rings. I'll leave this hole in here because that's useful for getting it in and out. But uh, man, that was rough. So we got some junk in here. This back seal looks, oh no, it's falling apart. The spring's falling out. This front one is pretty torn up too. You can see right in there. So it's the same, I think it's the same part number. I got two replacements here. They look like they've been sitting on a shelf since 1965. So I'm gonna go soak these in gear oil for a while. The rubber looks okay, but the spring's a little rusty. It should be fine. Okay, so one thing you might not be able to see, but you can see the edge, this outside edge is like clean halfway and then the rest is, is rusty like that. This is actually the ceiling surface. It goes in like that. So it's very important not to uh, probably, probably very important not to grip on here with a vise and mar this up and I'll be cleaning this all off too. This is like sticking way out and they're not backed up against each other. I'm not sure why that is. So the reason there's two seals facing away from each other is one side seals the transmission fluid from getting into the winch and the other side seals the winch fluid from getting into the transmission. A little bit of a predicament here. So I think these seals were in backwards. And the reason is, is if you think about it, this is the transmission and this is the winch over here. So to seal the transmission fluid out, you should be installing the seal in the front seal like that and the rear seal like that, right? But I just looked, through, I just watched the video back. This was the front seal and it was installed like that. You can see the line where this was installed like that, which is backwards for what I just said. So I, it must not matter too, too much. The transmission and the winch use the same fluid anyways. So I think just to keep junk from getting in the seals, I'll install them like that since these are both two-sided seals just for this reason probably. There's a fair amount of space between these two seals, but I think the alignment, just getting them flush on both sides is more important. So I just hammered them in up to this point right here. Got a lot of material removed off here. That's how a snap ring is supposed to go in. Okay, I cleaned up this pinion gear and you can see there is actually some damage to it. Um, this looks like, if, I, if anything, this is just picking up grit off the bottom of the case. A lot of these teeth have the exact same pattern. In fact, they pretty much all do. So that's why it was so important to get the the bottom of the case cleaned out and coated so that rust grit doesn't get in here anymore. This should be fine though.
There we go. All right, well, the shaft goes in here. The question though is how does this actually seal against the housing? There's seven shims on the shaft, so even if there was a gasket that you could put on, it would just leak through those. There's no gasket on the assembly. So I'm guessing maybe there's just kind of a semi-interference fit from here to this inside flange. But I think what I'm gonna do, just cause it's probably worn more than it should be, is I'll put a light uh, RTV coating on here. And then when I install it, hopefully that kind of helps seal it up. So these, the old bolts did not have safety wire on them. I'm, I'm almost sure they did originally, but I'm gonna use just Loctite. Well, you can see in there, there's a nice little ring of RTV that's currently V'ing. And uh, let's see if it spins. It spins, that's good. Good sign. So there's, there's a, a little concern I have, and that's the excessive end play clearance on this side shaft. It moves a significant amount. Actually, a lot less with that pinion gear in now. But I think that's by design, and I'll show you. So the bearing in here is just a ball bearing. It's like a roller ball bearing. So there's a significant amount of play on the shaft, and I'm pretty sure that's on purpose because it, this has to connect to the PTO on the on the transmission so it probably needs a little bit of you know wiggle wiggling and with that much wiggling i think you need a lot of end play clearance on this other pinion shaft here otherwise it's going to tear itself up so hopefully that's the theory at least i mean i am just pretty much guessing in, in case i didn't mention it in the parts manual there's no specs for anything there's no clearances or torque settings or anything it's just, all there is is just how to adjust the brakes and parts diagrams. So I'm just using my best judgment here. Okay, so this is the middle shaft here. I'm seeing some, I don't know if you can see that, some uh, damage to these teeth, just a little bit. Looks like from grit, similar, but not as bad to the bottom pinion. Also on this gear, I believe this is the gear that this slides back and forth to select forward or reverse. You can see there's a lip on here where it's been ground down. So I'm just gonna smooth this out very gently, trying not to overheat this tooth. I'm trying to remember how to do this right. This one went in first, then the big gear went in. So I mentioned in the last video, kind of as a joke, that I was gonna boil this gear to get it back on. What I really meant was I'm gonna put it in oil and heat it up. I saw a lot of comments of people saying, you gotta put it in an oven or a toaster oven to, uh, to, to, to heat it up. And I just, I really wanna say that's a bad idea. Now the reason is, and I've done that before, but the reason is you don't wanna do that is for a bearing or a gear that's hardened, you don't want it to get over about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And when you put it in an oven, I mean, you can set the oven to 250, but that's the average temperature. And when the oven element kicks on, that thing is about 1,000, 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's blasting right on the side of your gear, and that's gonna ruin the temper. So oil is a much better option for gears and bearings because you can control the temperature a lot easier. With that being said, I don't want the gear sitting directly on the bottom. So I'm gonna use these old uh, seals as spacers, and I'll set the gear on that and uh, we'll warm this thing up. So if you saw the steering clutch video where I put my steering clutches back together, this is basically the exact same thing I did, except on those bearings I hung them, and this one I'm just setting them on those uh, seals. And we're going for about 240, 250 degrees. Anything hotter is gonna start ruining the hardness on this gear. Oh, that was easy. Okay, I threw this bearing in while the oil was still hot, so let me get it on here. Pop it on.
Okay, that's it for that side. For this side, for this cup on this bearing, I remember that it, it came out very easily. So I'm going to cheat and I'm gonna use some bearing or retaining compound to hold this cup in place when I hammer it in. And that should hopefully keep this whole thing together. So these are the, <clears throat> on this level is the original Timken bearings and they are still in good condition. There's no really scores or anything in here. There's a couple tiny spots, but this should be okay. So that part's in that retaining compound setting. It's still not all the way set. There's a gap right there. I'll put the cover on here with the gasket, let that set, and then I'll come over here and then just draw this bearing cap in. Before I do that though, I have to put this idler gear in here. So I'm working on that right now. Bearings on this gear look really good, just like the other bearings, but obviously this gear has been sitting for a while. So I'm gonna wire wheel it. Also got the same ridges on here. So I'll just smooth those out very delicately. You don't want to overheat this thing, but uh, it, just, it just has been ground a little bit. I believe this goes in here. Oh man, this is gonna be tough. All the gaskets on this thing were like paper thin. So I feel very comfortable using RTV for everything. So I'm gonna Loctite these. And obviously I've replaced the original Phillips with hex to make it easier for the next guy. I don't remember the size of these shims sticking out, but I just looked back at an old picture and sure enough, they're there. It's kind of cheesy. Just had to take it off. Would you believe there's actually a notch right here in this case? That's because it basically contacts right here. I noticed it was a little hard to go on. This is very tightly made here. I have a feeling when they assembled these things, they had to just grind reliefs in as they went. I mean, this does not look like it was uh, cast in this case originally. I'll torque all this down before I do the safety wire. All right, there's no wobble. Still turns easy, that's a good sign. The other thing I wanna mention is, if you see the wear pattern on this, this gear, you can see the line right there, maybe. So that lines exactly up with this tooth, which is good because there was these brass spacers on each side and they're different widths. So this does move a little bit, but a little piece of dirt there. Okay, well, bad news. I was prepping everything on the top shaft and I was looking at this bearing and yeah, that's it's been sitting like this with water in it. You can just tell it's, it's ruined right there. I found a corresponding spot on the rollers right here i mean i can you could you could drink water out of these pits here so i'm going to order a new set this is a uh what is timkin 477 so here's a bearing and cup which is the 472 which is that's the right number there 472 dash a so that's 80 dollars i'll look around for a little bit but uh, yeah, these things are expensive. And I'm gonna check the other bearing real quick too. Yeah, the other cup looks good. I mean, there's a couple tiny black spots, but nothing like the other one. And uh, yeah, these rollers look okay. So actually this other bearing is a Timken 559. I'm finding them here for cheap, 30 bucks. Yeah, this bearing is actually showing up as cheaper, even though even though it's way bigger than this other one. So I think I might just order the set. I mean, this is probably good enough to use, but 
there's there is spots in here I might as well replace it since i'm replacing the other side the other bearings down below did not have any of that they were very clean the races were like spotless so it's just something about this top one that maybe condensation was sitting in there well more bad news just as an afterthought i looked at this gear this is the gear that drives the big huge drum gear and it has needle bearings inside so here so here this one spins nice the bearing looks good other side you can see i'm using my phone here so we can get in close let me see if i can get a good angle here it's just completely toasted that's all rust in there and then that needle is broke and it's completely seized i can't even i can't even turn this the shaft this is the side that's on that bearing so the shaft is is bad but it's i think it's okay i mean this this doesn't spin that much right this only spins when the when the uh drum gear is spinning so i mean worst case is it's actually quite easy to replace this shaft it's just this shaft right here so you just pull off this one cover and then you you could easily pull that shaft out and replace it if you needed to i'm definitely going to need to replace this bearing though so this is a bantam 243320 let me look at the other side closer yeah there's a lot of grit in here as well so i might as well just replace both of these i got the worst roller out and look at that thing it's split into four pieces it's split in half and then it split again half lengthwise i've never seen that before well, as expected, this video took a long time to make, about three weeks, and a lot of that is just because the process of cleaning and painting everything is very time consuming. But also, it is springtime here, and with spring comes responsibilities. So it's just me out here, and there's 40 acres to take care of. So, um, you know, I guess the best way to put it is when springtime comes, there's a lot of chore to do, and uh, that's just the way it is. Anyway, part three of this winch rebuild, I'm going to fix the drum and get it, the winch put back together and then hopefully mount it to the tractor. I wasn't originally gonna put it back on before paint, but I think it's gonna be worth it to get it painted while it's on there. It'll be a lot easier and the colors will all match a lot better. So that's the plan for the next video. And uh, once again, guys, thanks a lot for watching. I really appreciate it and I'll be back soon. Hopefully sooner than three weeks.